everybody, a massive welcome to Connect Group tonight. So glad that you're joining us. My name's Junior. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, this is Jaden Bay. He's our How we campus pastor. And we just want to welcome you. Wherever you're watching tonight, whether it's at Palmy, Fielding, Paihia Tour, Massey University, wherever you're watching around the region, just a huge welcome. We're so glad that you're yeah. joining us with your Connect Group. Absolutely. Come on, join the person next to you. Give them a big whole high five and say, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. And Jaden, I wonder if you had a budget of one hundred dollars. If you had a budget of one hundred dollars and you could have dinner by yourself on Friday night, Brown is taking the kids somewhere. <laughs> what would you eat? Probably head to the strong room and feeling. Oh. Amazing local uh, location. Shout out to the promotion. Um, potato skins, maybe as an entree. Real nice, nice, nice dipping. Um, okay. Good steak. And maybe a butterscotch pudding for dessert with an amazing Bundaberg ginger beer. So it's pretty good to me. It's great for the cholesterol. Love. It. <laughs> amazing. Hey, um, tonight we're going to jump in and we'll frame this discussion Easter follow up. That's Easter follow up. And the reason is because we've just had an amazing week um, gathering together as a church on Good Friday, both campuses coming together. It was so powerful. And then Resurrection Sunday, such a sense of faith in the room. Yeah. And Come on, how great was that? Come on, let's just put our hands together. Yeah, let's just awesome. thank the Lord for what he has done this last weekend. And uh, we wanted this week of Connect Groups, right off the back of Easter, to follow up the Easter message and really sit in what God yeah. has done for us. And the important thing to remember is that the message of Easter is a special weekend, yeah. but it exists to form us for every other week of the year. Yeah, In other words, it's about coming back to the story Coming back to the crux and the core of our faith, which is yeah. the death and resurrection of Jesus, so that it can catapult us yeah. into a deeper life of devotion as a follower of Jesus. Amen. Good. And so I'm um, Jaden's going to read Hebrews chapter two, um, verses nine to eighteen, um, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit, and then we're going to split into our groups. Awesome. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone, and bringing many sons and daughters to glory. It was fitting that God, for whom and through everything exists, should be made the pioneer of their salvation, perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, he says. I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here I am and the children God has given me. Verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who are all their lives were held in slavery, by their fear of death. For surely it is not the angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Such a powerful verse, such a great summary of what We'll be remembering over the weekend of Easter. Um, three things we want to talk about in this passage. Identity, hope, and victory. Mm. Identity, hope, and victory. Jaden, can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of being an identity-centered yeah. disciple? Yeah, absolutely. The importance of being an identity-centered disciple as opposed to a circumstance-centered disciple is, is so critical. Mm. Life has so many ups and downs, there's heartaches, there are times of joy, times of celebration, times of happiness, times of sorrow, times where everything seems to be falling down around us. So let's be honest, if, if we dictated or we lived our lives based on just those circumstances alone, we're going to be up and down yeah. like a yo, -yo. it's just going to be up and down all over the place. It's not going to be a life that is, is good for us or our family or, or those that are around us. So true. Let's look for a moment at a, at a child. Now, whether you're a parent here or not, we've all seen or experienced amazing children when they have a tantrum. Perhaps they don't get, get what they want or get their way. Maybe you've seen a, a kid go nuts in a supermarket. And if you're a parent, it's, it's our goal to raise emotionally resilient children that can go without a lollipop and hopefully be okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we do joke about that, but the importance of that in our relationship and our walk 
as disciples of Christ is, is so crucial. Yeah. Ephesians 4 verse 14 says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine or by the trickery of men, mm. but speaking the truth in love that we may grow up in all things into him, into Jesus who is here, that is yeah. Christ. Yeah, correct. Come on, as much as that's the goal for our kids, how much more is it a goal for us as, as God's children? Yeah. Let's look at an example just real quick. Let's say a, a, a job loss, perhaps, or a rental application gets turned down. That's a struggle. That's a that's a that's a big deal. Exactly. That can create a lot of um, turmoil or, or things can really disrupt our lives. But mm. you know, I'm saying love that Jesus is the same when you had that job or when you had the hope of getting that rental, and He's still the same after that circumstance or that situation happened the truth of the gospel doesn't change mm. because of our circumstances mm. and if we're walking in a christ-centered identity we can be joyful because the joy of the lord is our strength while we're employed mm. or while we're going for that application yeah but the truth is the same after that's been denied or after that situation yeah. has changed yeah that's so true i think with this reflected on easter when we look at the night before jesus is crucified you see two responses you see his disciples scatter mm. under the pressure because the circumstance seemed right. And then you see Jesus, identity-centered, constantly using this word in his prayer against him and he, Father. Mm. When he's on the cross, Father. Right. This identity-centered mm. faithfulness to his call. We see that example from Jesus. And in the scripture we just read, there's all this family language. Right. It says that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone and bring many sons and daughters mm. It says in verse 12, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. Right. And then it says again, here am I and the children God has given me. Yeah. Since the children, this all this family tomb, and I think it's so important to understand if we're going to grow and mature and be devoted, it's not just going to come from your willpower and your strength yeah. and your discipline. It's good. It's going to come from a deep centered mm. identity and I belong to Christ. And that is what determines my life, yeah. my habits, and my tendencies, and the stability that I can have, yeah. no matter what the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's so important. Jack, um, just before we do go to the next question, I think it's important to also see that identity also leads to holiness. Yeah, and I, you touched on some of the struggles people can have at times, um, and we'll talk about that again in just a moment. But it says in verse eleven here, it says that. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. Mm. And so I just want to like pastorally encourage you. If you're struggling with lust, you're struggling with pride, you're struggling with temptations and struggles in your life, there are some things and decisions you need to make. But I want to encourage you to come back to this question. Man, am I really anchored in my identity yep. as a child of God? Mm -hmm. Do the deep work there. Yeah. And just on that, Jaden, can you talk to us about what does victory in Christ actually look like because yeah. we sing about it we preach about it we're victorious yeah we've just had resurrection sunday yeah what does a resurrected victorious christian life actually look like awesome a, a, a great question you know there's so many things and i think our walk as disciples or christians that as junior said we, we sing about it we hope for or we know or we're reading god's word but sometimes the reality of walking those out is an entirely different story together or, or sometimes things just need to be almost demystified we look at being victorious mm. and i think that in itself can seem so high it's so unobtainable i know it definitely looks like that for me in times past you're going oh my goodness how can i ever be at this point or how can i can't do that you just feel so far removed from that place of intimacy with christ mm. and i think it's just recognizing that we all need to go on a journey let, let, let's just read first corinthians 15 verse 57 it says thanks be to god who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we know that we have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, but as we've said, how do we how do we work that out or how does that look mm. day to day? Let's just take a moment to look at what our understanding is of, of being a slave. We, we have that thought, we, we have that understanding. A slave is perhaps someone that is bound, someone that has no free will, someone that can't make their decisions on their own, they don't have freedom of movement. That kind of thought or that sense in being bound to sin, it's that in those circumstances we can't say no, we don't know how to turn away, we we don't have any other option or mm. perhaps we want to say no but we end up giving it anyways and it's that sense of, of being bound. So how do we begin to start that journey? I, I think it's by 
um, maybe just taking things one day at a time mm. or making a decision that let's really go all in in the battle. Let's not get stressed or worried about the, the victory of the entire war. Uh, I like history and military history and those sort of things. And I often read about World War II, the, the Allies had to go on a journey to get victory over the, over the Nazi forces. Um, you know, they obviously had a goal and a plan to attain ultimate victory. But there were often times where they had to just focus on the battle ahead or they had to pull resources from different places to just win what was in front of them. Yeah. And I think we need to do that as, as Christians, as, as disciples, as we're looking at, uh, at, at being free from these things. Yeah. What do some of those small things look like? Mm. I mentioned before, one day at a time. You know, it's, a, it's an incredible victory when you're, you're lying in bed at night and you make the decision to turn the phone off and go to sleep Great. rather than going to places you shouldn't be going at, 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 you know, in secrecy or at night. That, that is a victory. You might not have won the entire war, but you made a step in the right direction for victory. Mm. I like the terminology of, of setting up guardrails. Um, guardrails that you can hold on to or you can lean on or perhaps you can identify the situations that those guardrails are protecting you from. Like if there's a construction site and there's a hole in the ground and there's a fence around it. I think it's important for us to recognize the danger that lies ahead. Maybe just as I said, that danger is late at night. Um, you know, you're tired, you're, you've got no, no willpower of your own left hand. Maybe as a guardrail, you need to leave your phone in the kitchen. I don't know what that looks like for you. Correct. Um, recognizing some of those struggles. Yeah, so good. Just as we conclude, Charles Spurgeon says this, faith is the eye of the soul. It is the act of looking unto Jesus. This passage began with, and we do see Jesus. And we see throughout this passage, identity, hope, and victory. And I just want to encourage you, we want to encourage you, church, that as we come out of Easter, let's be Christians that are identity-centered, living a life of gratitude to the hope that we have, because as the scriptures tell us, he himself suffered when he was tempted, but he did not sin. Our hope is not in our performance. Our hope is in the finished performance of Christ. We'll be glad that. And then ultimately, we have the victory. We have the ability to not be slaves to sin. If we can live this identity-centered life yeah. and devoted to Christ, we can overcome because Christ gives us the victory. Amen. We're going to pass back to your leaders now. Have an incredible time discussing this and praying together. Love you so much. And we'll see you next time.